Anecdote of the Jar by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake July 11, 2006 In Long Branch, New Jersey PaintedRiceCakes.org I placed a jar in Tennessee And round it was upon a hill It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill the wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild the jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port in air it took dominion everywhere the jar was gray and bare it did not give a bird or bush like nothing else in tennessee end of poem this poem is in the public domain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Liu. The Blue Flag in the Bog by Anna St. Vincent Millay. God had called us, and we came. Our loved earth to ashes left. Heaven was a neighbor's house, open to us, bereft. Gay the lights of heaven showed, and t'was God who walked ahead. Yet I wept along the road, wanting my own house instead. Wept unseen, unheeded cried, All you things my eyes have kissed, fare you well. We meet no more, lovely, lovely tattered mist. Weary wings that rise and fall All day long above the fire Red with heat was every wall Rough with heat was every wire Fare you well, you little winds That the flying embers chase Fare you well, you shuddering day With your hands before your face And ah, blackened by strange blight Or to a false sun unfurled now forevermore, goodbye, all the gardens in the world. On the windless hills of heaven that I have no wish to see, white eternal lilies stand by a lake of ebony. But the earth forevermore is a place where nothing grows. Dawn will come and no bud break, evening and no blossom close. Spring will come and wander slow Over an indifferent land Stand beside an empty creek Hold a dead seed in her hand God had called us and we came But the blessed road I trod Was a bitter road to me And at heart I questioned God Though in heaven, I said Be all that the heart would most desire Held earth not save souls of sinners Worth saving from a fire Withered grass, the wasted growing Aimless ache of laden bows Little things God had forgotten Called me from my burning house Though in heaven I said Be all that the eye could ask to see All the things I ever knew Are this blaze in back of me Though in heaven, I said, be all that the ear could think to lack, all the things I ever knew are this roaring at my back. It was God who walked ahead, like a shepherd to the fold, in his footsteps fare the weak and the weary and the old, glad enough of gladness over, ready for the peace to be, but a thing God had forgotten was the growing bones of me. And I drew a bit apart, and I lagged a bit behind, and I thought on peace eternal, lest you look into my mind. And I gazed upon the sky, and I thought of heavenly rest, and I slipped away like water through the fingers of the blessed. All their eyes were fixed on glory, 
not a glance brushed over me. Alleluia, alleluia, up the road, and I was free. And my heart rose like a freshet, and it swept me on before, giddy as a whirling stick, till I felt the earth once more. All the earth was charred and black, fire had swept from pole to pole, and the bottom of the sea was as brittle as a bowl. In the timbered mountain top was as naked as a skull, nothing left, nothing left of the earth so beautiful. Earth, I said, how can I leave you? You are all I have, I said. What is left to take my mind up, living always, and you dead? Speak, I said, oh, tell me something. Make a sign that I can see, for a keepsake, to keep always. Quick, before God misses me. And I listened for a voice, but my heart was all I heard. Not a screech owl, not a loon. Not a tree toad said a word, and I waited for a sign. Coals and cinders, nothing more, and a little cloud of smoke floating on a valley floor. And I peered into the smoke till it rotted like a fog. There, encompassed round by fire, stood a blue flag in a bog. Little flames came wading out, Straining, straining towards its stem, but it was so blue and tall that it scorned to think of them. Red and thirsty were their tongues, as the tongues of wolves must be, but it was so blue and tall. Oh, I laughed, I cried to see. All my heart became a tear, all my soul became a tower. Never loved I anything. I love that tall blue flower. It was all the little boats that had ever sailed the sea. It was all the little books that had gone to school with me. On its roots, like iron claws, rearing up so blue and tall, it was all the gallant earth with its back against a wall. In a breath, ere I had breathed, oh, I laughed. I cried to see. I was kneeling at its side, and it leaned its head on me. Crumbling stones and sliding sand is the road to heaven now. I see at my straining knees drags the awful undertow. Soon but stepping stones of dust will the road to heaven be. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, reach a hand and rescue me. There, there, my blue flag flower, hush, hush, go to sleep. That is only God you hear, counting up his folded sheep. Lullaby, lullaby, that is only God that calls, missing me, seeking me, ere the road to nothing falls. He will set his mighty feet firmly on the sliding sand. Like a little frightened bird, I will creep into his hand. I will tell him all my grief. I will tell him all my sin. He will give me half his robe for a cloak to wrap you in. Lullaby, lullaby. Rocks of burnt out, planet free. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, reach a hand and rescue me. Ah, the voice of love at last. Lo, at last the face of light, and the whole of his white robe, for a cloak against the night, and upon my heart asleep, all the things I ever knew, holds heaven not some cranny, Lord, for a flower so tall and blue. All's well, and all's well, yea, the lights of heaven show, in some moist and heavenly place, we will set it out to grow. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Liu. Bluebeard by Edna St. Vincent Millay. This door you might not open, and you did. So enter now, and see for what slight thing you are betrayed. Here is no treasure hid, no cauldron, no clear crystal mirroring the sought-for truth, no heads of women slain or greed like yours, no wreathings of distress, but only what you see. Look yet again, an empty room, cobwebbed and comfortless, Yet this alone out of my life I kept unto myself, lest any know me quite. And you did so profane me when you crept unto the threshold of this room tonight, that I must never more behold your face. This now is yours. I seek another place. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Contemplation Upon Flowers by Henry King Read for LibriVox.org by Dexnell Peters Brave flowers! that I could gallant it like you and be as little vain. You come abroad and make a harmless show and to your beds of earth again. You are not proud, you know your birth, for your embroidered garments are from earth. You do obey your months and time, but I would have it ever spring. My faith would know no winter, never die, not think of such a thing. Oh that I could my bed of earth but view, and smile, and look as cheerfully as you. Oh, teach me to see debt, and not to fear, but rather to take truce. How often have I seen you at a beer, and there look fresh and spruce, you fragrant flowers. Then teach me that my breath, like yours, may sweeten and perfume my debt. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Cradle Song by W. B. Yeats The angels are stooping above your bed, They are weary of trooping with the whimpering dead. God's laughing in heaven to see you so good, The sailing seven are gay with his mood. I sigh that kiss you, for I must own, That I shall miss you when you have grown. End of poem This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Down by the Sally Gardens by W. B. Yeats. Down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She passed the Sally Gardens with little snow white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the tree, but I, being young and foolish, with her would not agree. In a field by the river my love and I did stand, and on my leaning shoulder she laid her snow-white hand. She bid me take life easy, as the grass grows on the weirs, but I was young and foolish, and now I'm full of tears. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. A Drinking Song by W.B. Yeats Wine comes in at the mouth, and love comes in at the eye. That's all we shall know for truth, before we grow old and die. I lift the glass to my mouth, I look at you, and I sigh. End of poem. An Enigma by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Matthew Royal Seldom we find, says Solomon Don Dunce, half an idea in the profoundest sonnet, through all the flimsy things we see at once as easily as through a Naples bonnet. Trash of all trash! How can a lady don it? Yet heavier far than your Petrarchan stuff, owl downy nonsense at the faintest puff twirls into trunk paper the while you con it. And veritably, soul is right enough. The general Tucker manatees are errant bubbles, ephemeral and so transparent. But this is now, you may depend upon it, stable, opaque, immortal, all by dint of the dear names that lie concealed within. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Evolution by Langdon Smith. Read for LibriVox.org by Dave Ranson. When you were a tadpole and I was a fish in the Paleozoic time, and side by side on the ebbing tide we sprawled through the ooze and slime, or skittered with many a caudal flip through the depths of the Cambrian fen, my heart was rife with the joy of life, for I loved you even then. Mindless we lived and mindless we loved and mindless at last we died, and deep in the rift of the Caradoc drift we slumbered side by side. The world turned on in the lathe of time, the hot lands heaved amain, till we caught our breath from the womb of death and crept into light again. We were amphibians, scaled and tailed and drab as a dead man's hand. We coiled at ease neath the dripping trees or trailed through the mud and sand. Croaking and blind with our three-clawed feet, writing a language dumb, with never a spark in the empty dark to hint at a life to come. Yet happy we lived, and happy we loved, and happy we died once more. Our forms were rolled in the clinging mold of a Neocomian shore. The eons came, and the eons fled, and the sleep that wrapped us fast was riven away in the newer day, and the night of death was past. Then light and swift through the jungle trees we swung in our airy flights, or breathed in the bombs of the fronded palms in the hush of the moonless nights. And oh, what beautiful years were there when our hearts clung each to each, when life was filled and our senses thrilled in the first faint dawn of speech. Thus life by life and love by love we passed through the cycles strange, and breath by breath and death by death we followed the chain of change, till there came a time in the law of life when over the nursing side the shadows broke and the soul awoke in a strange dim dream of God. I was thewed like an auroch bull, and tusked like the great cave bear, and you, my sweet, from head to feet, were gowned in your glorious hair. Deep in the gloom of a fireless cave, when the night fell o'er the plain, and the moon hung red o'er the river bed, we mumbled the bones of the slain. I flaked a flint to a cutting edge, and shaped it with brutish craft. I broke a shank from the woodland lank, and fitted it head and haft. Then I hid me close to the reedy tarn where the mammoth came to drink. Through the brawn and bone I drove the stone and slew him upon the brink. Loud I howled through the moonlit wastes, loud answered our kith and kin. From west to east to the crimson feast the clan came tramping in. O'er joint and gristle and padded hoof we fought and clawed and tore. And cheek by jowl with many a growl we talked the marvel o'er. I carved that fight on a reindeer bone with rude and hairy hand. I pictured his fall on the cavern wall that men might understand. For we lived by blood in the right of might ere human laws were drawn, and the age of sin did not begin till our brutal tush was gone. And that was a million years ago in a time that no man knows. Yet here tonight in the mellow light we sit at Delmonico's. Your eyes are deep as the Devon Springs, your hair is dark as jet. Your years are few, your life is new, your soul untried, and yet our trail is on the Kimmeridge clay and the scarp of the Purbeck flags. We have left our bones in the bagshot stones and deep in the coralline crags. Our love is old, 
our lives are old, and death shall come amain. Should it come today, what man may say, we shall not live again? God wrought our souls from the Tremadoc beds, and furnished them wings to fly. He sowed our spawn in the world's dim dawn, and I know that I shall not die. Though cities have sprung above the graves where the crookbone men make war, and the oxwain creeks o'er the buried caves where the mummied mammoths are, then as we linger at luncheon here o'er many a dainty dish, let us drink anew to the time when you were a tadpole and I was a fish. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Exile's Letter by Ezra Pound Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake July 17, 2006 In Long Branch, New Jersey PaintedRiceCakes.org From the Chinese of Li Po Usually considered the greatest poet of China Written by him while in exile about 760 A.D. To the hereditary war counselor of Shou Recollecting former companionship So kin of Raku Ho, ancient friend I now remember that you built me a special tavern By the south side of the bridge at Ten Shin With yellow gold and white jewels we paid for the songs and laughter And we were drunk for month after month Forgetting the kings and princes Intelligent men came drifting in from the sea and from the west border, and with them, and with you especially, there was nothing at cross-purpose. And they made nothing of sea-crossing or mountain-crossing. If only they could be of that fellowship. And we all spoke out our hearts and minds, and without regret. And then I was sent off to South Way, smothered in laurel groves and you to the north of Raku Hoku, till we had nothing but thoughts and memories between us. And when separation had come to its worst, we met and traveled together into Sen-Go, through all the thirty-six folds of the turning and twisting waters, into a valley of a thousand bright flowers. That was the first valley. And on into ten thousand valleys full of voices and pine winds, with silver harness and reins of gold prostrating themselves on the ground, out came the east of Khan Foreman and his company, and there came also the true man of Shi Yo to meet me, playing on a jeweled mouth organ. In the storied houses of San Ko, they gave us more Senen music, many instruments like the sound of young phoenix broods. And the foreman of Kang Chu, drunk, danced because his long sleeves wouldn't keep still, with the music playing. And I, wrapped in brocade, went to sleep with my head on his lap. And my spirit so high that it was all over the heavens. And before the end of the day we were scattered like stars or rain. I had to be off to sow, far away over the waters, you back to your river bridge, and your father, who was brave as a leopard, was governor of Hei Shu, and put down the barbarian rabble. And one May he had you send for me, despite the long distance, and what with broken wheels and so on, I wouldn't say it wasn't hard going, over roads twisted like sheep's guts, and I was still going late in the year, in the cutting wind from the north and thinking how little you cared for the cost, and you caring enough to pay it. Then what a reception! Red jade cups, foods well set, on a blue jeweled table, and I was drunk and had no thought of returning, and you would walk out with me to the western corner of the castle, to the dynastic temple, with the water about it clear as blue jade, with boats floating, and the sound of mouth organs and drums, with ripples like dragon scales going grass green on the water, pleasure lasting, with courtesans going and coming without hindrance, with the willow flakes falling like snow, 
and the vermilion girls getting drunk about sunset, and the waters a hundred feet deep reflecting green eyebrows. Eyebrows painted green are a fine sight in young moonlight, gracefully painted, and the girls singing back at each other, dancing in transparent brocade, and the wind lifting the song and interrupting it, tossing it up under the clouds. And all this comes to an end, and it is not again to be met with. I went up to the court for examination, tried La Yu's luck, offered the Cho Yu song, and got no promotion, and went back to the East Mountain, white-headed. And once again we met, later, at the South Bridge Head, and then the crowd broke up. You went north to San Palace, and if you ask how I regretted the parting, it is like the flowers falling on spring's edge, confused, whirled in a tangle. What's the use of talking? And there is no end of talking. There is no end of things in the heart. I call in the boy, have him sit on my knees to write and seal this, and I send it a thousand miles, thinking. Translated by Ezra Pound from the notes of the late Fennel Rosa and the decipherings of the professors Mori and Araga. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Forsaken Garden by Algernon Charles Swinburne. Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes. In a coin of the cliff between lowland and highland, at the sea down's edge between windward and lee, walled round with rocks as an inland island, the ghost of a garden fronts the sea. A girdle of brushwood and thorn encloses the steep square slope of the blossomless bed where the weeds that grew green from the graves of its roses now lie dead. The fields fall southward, abrupt and broken, to the low last edge of the long lone land. If a step should sound, or a word be spoken, would a ghost not rise at the strange guest's hand? So long have the grey bare walks lain guestless, through branches and briars, if a man make way, he shall find no life but the sea winds, restless, night and day. The dense, hard passage is blind and stifled, that crawls by a track none turn to climb, to the straight waste place that the years have rifled of all but the thorns that are touched not of time. The thorns he spares when the rose is taken, The rocks are left when he wastes the plain, The wind that wanders, the weeds wind-shaken, These remain. Not a flower to be pressed of the foot that falls not, As the heart of a dead man the seed-plots are dry, From the thicket of thorns whence the nightingale calls not, Could she call? There were never a rose to reply. Over the meadows that blossom and wither Rings but the note of a seabird song. Only the sun and the rain come hither All year long. The sun burns sere and the rain dishevels One gaunt bleak blossom of scentless breath. Only the wind here hovers and revels In a round where life seems barren as death. Here there was laughing of old, there was weeping, Haply of lovers none ever will know, Whose eyes went seaward a hundred sleeping years ago. Heart, hand fast in heart as they stood, Look thither, did he whisper? Look forth from the flower to the sea, For the foam flowers endure when the rose blossoms wither, And men that love lightly may die, but we? 
and the same wind sang, and the same waves whitened, and or ever the garden's last petals were shed, in the lips that had whispered, the eyes that had lightened, love was dead. Or they loved their life through, and then went whither, and were one to the end, but what end, who knows, love Deep as the sea, as a rose must wither, As the rose-red seaweed that mocks the rose. Shall the dead take thought for the dead to love them? What love was ever as deep as a grave? They are loveless now as the grass above them, or the wave. All are at one now, roses and lovers, Not known of the cliffs and the fields and the sea. Not a breath of the time that has been hovers in the air now, soft with a summer to be. Not a breath shall there sweeten the seasons hereafter, of the flowers or the lovers that laugh now or weep, when as they that are free now of weeping and laughter, we shall sleep. Here death may deal not again forever, here change may come not till all change end, from the graves they have made they shall rise up never, who have left not living to ravage and rend, earth, stones, and thorn of the wild ground growing, while the sun and the rain live, these shall be, till the last wind's breath upon all these blowing roll the sea. Till the slow sea rises, and the sheer cliff crumble, Till terrace and meadow the deep gulfs drink, Till the strength of the waves and the high tides humble, The fields that lessen, the rocks that shrink. Here now in his triumph where all things falter, Stretched out on the spoils that his own hand spread, as a god self-slain on his own strange altar, death lies dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Flanders Fields by John McCrae Read for LibriVox.org by Kevin Steinbach in Flanders fields the poppies blow, Between the crosses row on row, That mark our place, and in the sky The larks, still bravely singing, fly, Scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, Loved and were loved, and now we lie In Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. End of poem. Just Think by Robert Service Read for LibriVox.org by Betsy Bush just think some night the stars will gleam upon a cold gray stone and trace a name with silver beam and lo twill be your own that night is speeding on to greet your epitaphic rhyme but life is but a little beat within the heart of time a little gain a little pain a laugh lest you may moan a little blame a little fame a star gleam on a stone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Kraken by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Tizer. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the kraken sleepeth. 
faintest sunlights flee about his shadowy sides. Above him swell huge sponges of millennial growth and height, and far away into the sickly light, from many a wondrous grot and secret cell, unnumbered and enormous polypy, winnow with giant arms the slumbering green. There hath he lain for ages and will lie, battening upon huge sea-worms in his sleep, until the latter fire shall heap the deep, then once by man and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise, and on the surface die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Parable of the Old Men and the Young by Wilfred Owen Read for LibriVox.org by David Barnes Parable of the Old Men and the Young So Abram rose, and clave the wood, and went, and took the fire with him, and a knife, and as they sojourned both of them together, Isaac the firstborn spake, and said, My father, behold the preparations, fire and iron, but where the lamb for this burnt offering? Then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps, and builded parapets and trenches there, and stretched forth the knife to slay his son. When, lo, an angel called out from heaven, saying, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. Behold, a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Offer the ram of pride instead of him. But the old man would not do so, but slew his son. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pity by Sarah Teasdale. Read for LibriVox.org by Betsy Bush. They never saw my lover's face. They only knew our love was brief, wearing a while a windy grace and passing like an autumn leaf. They wonder why I do not weep. They think it strange that I can sing. They say, her love was scarcely deep, since it has left so slight a sting. They never saw my love, nor knew, that in my heart's most secret place I pity them as angels do, men who have never seen God's face. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Welcome to The Raven, recorded for LibriVox.org and the public domain by AmigoAudio.com. The Raven in Spanish, El Cuervo, will hopefully be available soon in the Spanish section of the LibriVox catalog. To volunteer to record for the public domain in the language of your choice, visit LibriVox.org. And now, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, oh, distinctly I remember it was in a bleak December, and each separate dying ember brought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, 
filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to still the beating of my heart I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door." Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, I said, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I open wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before, Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but with mine of lord and lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on this night's Plutonian shore. Quote the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on that placid bust spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Taught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope the melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, 
Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy into fancy, thinking that this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press uh, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God has lent thee. By these angels he has sent thee respite, respite and nepenthe from the memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a saintly maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quote the raven. Nevermore. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on that pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore the end recorded june 2006 by the team at amigoaudio.com adios and happy trails the skipping rope by Alfred Lord Tennyson, read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Tizer. Sure never yet was antelope could skip so lightly by. Stand off, or else my skipping rope will hit you in the eye. How lightly whirls the skipping rope, how fairy-like you fly. Go, get you gone, you muse and mope, I hate that silly sigh. Nay, dearest, teach me how to hope, or tell me how to die. There, take it, take my skipping rope, and hang yourself thereby. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. To Marie Louise by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Matthew Royal Not long ago, the writer of these lines, in the mad pride of intellectuality, maintained the power of words, denied that ever a thought arose within the human brain beyond the utterance of the human tongue. And now, as if in mockery of that boast, two words, two foreign soft dissyllables, Italian tones, made only to be murmured by angels dreaming in the moonlit dew that hangs like chains of pearl on Herman Hill, have stirred from out the abysses of his heart, unthought-like thoughts that are the souls of thought, richer, far wilder, far diviner visions than even the seraph harper Israfel, who has the sweetest voice of all God's creatures, could hope to utter. And I, my spells are broken, the pen falls powerless from my shivering hand. With thy dear name as text, though bidden by thee, I cannot write, I cannot speak or think, alas, I cannot feel, for tis not feeling, this standing motionless upon the golden threshold of the wide-open gate of dreams, gazing entranced adown the gorgeous vista, and thrilling as I see upon the right, upon the left, and all the way along, amid unpurpled vapors, far away to where the prospect terminates, thee only. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wild Swans at Cool by W. B. Yeats. The trees are in their autumn beauty, the woodland paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors a clear sky. Upon the brimming water, among the stones, are nine and fifty swans. The nineteenth autumn has come upon me, since I first made my count. I saw before I had well finished, all suddenly mount, and scatter wheeling in great broken rings upon their clamorous wings. I have looked upon these brilliant creatures, and now my heart is sore. All's changed since I, hearing at twilight, the first time on this shore, the bell beat of their wings above my head, trod with a lighter tread. Unwearied still, lover by lover, they paddle in the cold, companionable streams or climb the air, their hearts have not grown old. Passion or conquest, wander where they will, attend upon them still. But now they drift on the still water, mysterious, Beautiful, among what rushes will they build, by what lake's edge or pool? Delight men's eyes when I awake some day to find they have flown away. End of poem.